Today is August the 19th, 2010. We are interviewing Mr. Edgar McKay from Gulfport, Mississippi. Mr. McKay is 85 years old. He was born January the 2nd, 1925. My name is Juan Rivera. I will be conducting the interview. This interview is being conducted for REI Productions and the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress. Mr. McKay and I met through an article that was written about Duty Bound, a TV show produced by uh, REI Productions. For the record, sir, would you state your name and your age? I am Edgar L. McKay. I'm 85 years old. And what branch of service were you in? In the Army. And what was the, uh, your rank when you were in the service? PFC. And your dates of service? November 43 to, uh, what did I say it was? September. September of uh, 45. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. Before we get actually into the service itself, let's step back a little bit and let's talk about um, you. You were born in what city, sir? Born in Gulfport, Mississippi. And what kind of occupation did your father have? He was a bricklayer. My father was a bricklayer. Okay. And how many brothers and sisters do you have? There's four sisters and three brothers. There were seven of us wow. in the family. Everyone is still living except one brother. Ooh, good genes. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, before the war started, tell me what life was like for you, your family in Gulfport, Mississippi. Well, it was a normal, I had a normal childhood and I quit school in the seventh grade and my father was a bricklayer and my mother was a homemaker and I started working I guess when I was a young boy at 7-Up Bottling Company and then from there I worked for Dito Packing Company so I stayed pretty busy as a young man. Where were you the day you heard of Pearl Harbor? I was at home, at home. So, and it, it really shook me up to hear about it. Because I knew then that the war had started, that we were going to, you know, get into the war. Had you guys been reading much about it in the newspaper or, you know, what did you know about the potential of war during that time? Really, I don't think too much, didn't think too much about it because we didn't read it. My mother and father couldn't read and we had to more or less tell them what was going on and we really didn't care too much about in it, got involved in it. Okay, so the war happens, you, you've heard about it. Um, you didn't enlist for some time after, so you were drafted? I was drafted. Okay. And went to Camp Shelby, Mississippi, that's where I was inducted. From there I went to Camp Wheeler for my basic training. And from there I tried to, I got out of that and went to the paratroopers. And I stayed in the paratroopers for a mm, few months. I don't know just how many months. But anyhow, I broke my ankle on the first jump. So then I washed out of it. And that was when I was, went back into the Army. And then from there, from Fort Benning, I think I went on to, but to New York, they shipped me to New York, and then that was when I was fixing to go on overseas. So were you assigned, where did you um, get your assignment in terms of your next unit? Once you got into Europe is when you were assigned right. to your yes. new unit? Yes, when I got to Europe. I went over on uh, the Queen Elizabeth, went over on the Queen Elizabeth, and landed in uh, England, and we went across England, by train and went on over to La Havre, France. 
and there's where I met up with my unit, my 10th Armored, Infantry, 10th Armored Infantry Division. And from there, we went on into war, to battle. And that was one of Patton's? That was Patton's outfit, yes, General Patton. Now, prior to that, had you had any specialized training other than you had tried to get into the paratroopers? No, none. Okay. No training whatsoever. So you join the service, you go to boot camp, um, and you're, you're embracing life as a serviceman. Um, how difficult was that from a basically simple life uh, here in Gulfport to joining the service? How was your transformation? It was, uh, I'd say, difficult because you've really done a lot of training, close combat training, and it, it was difficult at first. And then the more I got into it, the easier it became. But at first it was really, I guess, difficult. But uh, I finally got used to it. Okay. Now, once you joined up with this unit, tell me, uh, were you guys uh, engaged in combat right away, or how? Uh, tell me the course of action. All right, I, when I shipped over there, I got with the group. It was at night when they took oh, five of us guys, I believe it was, to join the unit and they were in a bunker. And th th we were shelled right there. And a couple of my buddies got killed right there. And then I went on in and got with the unit. And from there on, we, uh, well, we fought quite a bit there. And Let's see. You would, whenever you were in the armor and infantry, you would ride tanks until you got into battle, and then you got off. Your duty was to protect the tanks. So then we were patting, as you know, his unit was out front in everything. And we would go through towns and take a town and go to the next one and let the infantry mop up because we would leave it and go on through. And now getting on into the battle, one time we got into a tank trap. And if you don't know what a tank trap is, it's a mountain with the road going around it, and you couldn't see the other end of it. And they had the front end of it blocked. So when we got into that trap, boy, they started shelling us from up above us. And I was manning a machine gun at the time, but some of the guys got killed on it, and a bazooka missed me by inches. We had the top of the tank lid open, and it missed just just inches. It missed me. The good Lord was with me all the way through this thing. And then how we got out, I don't know, but we did, and we lost about three, four tanks in that trap. And then another time, we was holding a river beachhead, a river, and it was snowing like everything. And we had our white capes that they issued us on account of the snow. And I was in one of the forward uh, foxholes. Me and a buddy of mine, we were in the foxhole watching the river. And we saw a guy coming up from the river. And I told the buddy of mine, I said, if he comes any closer, I'm going to have to shoot him. 
because I figured he would be a German coming across. But as it so happened, his cape blew off his head and I recognized him as our captain. So <laughs> that saved him and I was, it scared me to death then. And that's just a few of the actions that I was in. And we took oh, quite a few towns, which you don't mention, I don't know the names of them. And from there, we were pretty well through France. And then they called us to go to uh, uh, Bastogne. And we hightailed it to there and we liberated the paratroopers that were there. So it wasn't too long that we left from there and went back to, well, we reorganized what it did. And then we took this river with the train track still intact and we went across on it. And I don't know the dates and the times of this, but uh, about that time is when General Patton sent orders down for us to go liberate this camp. He didn't say it was his son-in-law, but to liberate this camp 60 miles behind German lines. And he gave A Company, which I was A Company, of infantry and C Company, I believe, of tanks. And that's all that we're allowed to go, just a company of infantry and a company of tanks. So we broke through one morning at Swineham. I can't pronounce the names real good. And we lost a couple of tanks there. And we went on, we got through that, uh, we broke through the lines, and we had trouble finding the main route to Hamelburg, where, where the prison camp was. And we went through a few towns, and at daybreak, a lot of the people came out in their night clothes to see what was going on. We were so far back there that they didn't realize that we were the enemy back that far. And we went on through that. And then we got to a town, I believe, Gamundan. I believe her memory served me right. It was a train depot. And there was a couple of trains loaded with Germans. So we shot that up pretty good. And we left from there. We, I don't believe we had any casualties there. We left from there and then, well, we did get detoured one place and we had to cut back. In other words, it was supposed to have taken us 24 hours to get there, but it took us longer than that. And then when we, did get to Hamburg, where well, we went on in and liberated the prison camp and got Patton's son-in-law out. And from what I understand, they took him out by a Jeep and took him to, there was a Piper Cub somewhere there and they flew him out. And I didn't hear any more about him at all. And then after we took the, prison camp, uh, we pulled back to reorganize so we could go back. And there wasn't too many of us, of the tanks and half tracks left. So the major ordered gas from the tanks. Or is it the other way? To put in the put in the half tracks. 
And by that time, we never did get really organized. Before the Germans, they surrounded us and started shooting at us in there and throwing hand grenades. So then the Major told us that it was pretty well helpless because they had us surrounded. And it was really every man for himself. And if you wanted to surrender, throw down your arms. But if you wanted to try to get back to your line, get to our lines, he, he, we had his permission to go. So a buddy of mine and I, we took off over the hill. That's when I got the shrapnel. And I guess we run and walked most of the night. And early the next morning, we were so tired that we figured we'd lay down and rest. So when we, we did, we slept a while, but then when we woke up, there were some Germans with dogs was facing us. They woke us up and made us get up and they disarmed us. And I was starting to run. Anyhow, he hit me with a bayonet right there. And so then they disarmed us and marched us back to where we were originally. And in the process, we had, they picked up others that had been tried to escape. And they took us back to where we were, where there were a lot of dead, a lot of bodies laying around. And we had to dig graves and bury our comrades. We had to bury them. And then from that, since I was wounded, they took me and put me in a German hospital in the POW camp. Well, I stayed in there the whole time, and I was only in there for 28 days. That was my duration of being a POW. So then the 7th Armored came in and liberated us. But before they did that, when the Seventh Army was approaching, well, the German would get every able-bodied person that could walk and make them go in front of their retreating soldiers. And from what happened, I don't know, because I stayed in the German hospital myself. And that's when the Seventh Army came in and liberated us. And the Red Cross came in soon afterwards. And from there, they put me in the 23rd General Hospital in France. And I stayed there for six weeks, I believe it was. And they tend, that's where I got my Purple Heart Medal. They pinned it on me there. So from there, they sent, I came back home on a Liberty ship and landed in New York, and they sent me on home. I stayed home for 30 days. After that, they sent me to Camp Landing, Florida. And while I was there, I spent 30 days on the beach, Miami Beach. They give me that, they call it R&R &R time. I stayed on Miami Beach for 30 days in the Bancroft Hotel. It's not there no more. I got pictures of it, but it's not there. And from there, I went back to Camp Landing, Florida, and that's where I got my discharge. Then I came back home. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> well, let's, let's step back. Very interesting story. Let me ask you a few questions now. All right. So you were given some orders that came down from Patton to go basically rescue his son-in-law. <laughs> In a sense, it was, but we didn't know it at the time. Okay, you were just told to go liberate. We this were told hall. this PW camp. Okay, that was some sixty miles or whatever behind. Sixty lines. miles behind German lines. Okay. Uh, when you're doing your fighting there, and then you get to the camp, 
Tell me how you guys engaged the camp to make the rescue. Well, we uh, back there, there were no, I don't guess you would say regular German soldiers. They were all rear echelon people. So the camp was pretty easy to take. And it took us maybe oh, an hour to liberate the camp. And this one guy that came with us, I forget his name, he was a captain. I wish I could think of his name. Anyhow, he was, General Patton sent him along with us because he's the only one that would recognize his son-in-law. So I assume he's the one that got Patton's son-in-law, and his name was Waters, I believe. Uh, John Waters was Patton's son-in-law's name. And got him out and flew him out, I assume. I didn't. I was busy doing some other things at the time, so I didn't know just how he got out. But I heard later that they flew him out. Okay, so you guys were able to um, procure this uh, rescue right. uh, for the, uh, this individual, and then he's removed and shipped away. Right. How long before the Germans were able to regroup in order to make a counter-assault on you? I would say two or three hours, because it would take us that long to get reorganized, because we had pulled back below a hill, and there was a barn there, then we regrouped there. And like I said, there wasn't too many of the tanks and half tracks left. And so in the meantime, that's when they surrounded us. And how they did it, I don't know, but they did. And they started firing ammunition into uh, to us and had throwing hand grenades in there. So that's when the major said it was every man for himself that we, there's no way we could escape as a whole. And it was every man for himself and he gave us permission to go if we wanted to go. Do you know whether he uh, tried to escape or that he surrendered immediately? I, I don't know because I left. And just this buddy of mine, we left. We took off over this hill. Now what happened to the others? I don't know, but there's articles later that he was a prisoner. Do you know whether they killed any of them intentionally at that time, or they just went ahead and uh, got them? There was nobody intentionally killed, because they could have killed us if they wanted to, because I tried to run. And the buddy of mine, he was a little afraid. And so he asked the Germans, he said, are y'all going to kill us right here? So he said, no, we're not going to kill you. We're going to take you back to the camp. And he said, is that what the Americans tell y'all, that we kill everybody? <laughs> now, I spoke up. I said, no, they didn't tell us that. Well, it's not like they had a good reputation. Unfortunately, we found that out after the fact. Yeah, right. They found out after. Okay. And, uh, well, and it was toward the end of the war now. It was, what, a couple of months later, I think the war ended. So we were talking more to, about rear echelon soldiers. Then, uh, so they were, I have to admit, they treated me good. So when you were in the hospital, you were treated I was treated humane. fairly well, yes. I was had taken care of. The food wasn't any good, but I was taken care of. And whenever they got people to march in front of the retreating German, I didn't go. I stayed in the hospital. Were you able to speak with any other American POWs that were in the hospital? Were there any around you or there by yourself? No, no, there were other prisoners in there. We were in bed bunks in the POW camp. And they were 
they're walking around in there, you know. But uh, I couldn't remember none of them's name. I, I don't know. Were there other branches or other countries that had oh, yeah. bailouts as, well, oh, yeah. as well? Oh yes, in that they, that was already there, and they didn't. They stayed in the camp. Some of them took off like we did, but I think there were some Russians in there, and. I don't know who else was there, but I know there was a couple of Russians in there. And that's about, about it. And you were there for 28 days? 28 days. Now, when you were, of course, in retrospect, we know what, how history unfolded, but when you became a POW, did you think, oh my God, how long am I gonna be here? Am I gonna die here? What were you thinking? I was thinking that this was probably be it because we had no news of anybody coming in to relieve us. And we just settled down to routine life, you know, in the POW camp. And they would feed us and treat us pretty good in it. And personally, I, I can't say anything bad about it, about being in prison camp, because it was, they were good to me. But they were rear echelon people now. They wasn't SS troops or nothing like that. Now, I didn't see any SS troops. Did they speak English? A couple of them did. What They had some Italian guides. The ones that captured us had some interpreters. They were Italian. And they were there. Some of them spoke English, you know but the real, most of them didn't. And did anybody speak uh, German uh, that you were aware of from either the Americans or other countries uh, that were in there with you? None that I know of, no. What was your day-to-day -day activities in a POW camp? Well, since I was wounded, I stayed mostly in my bed. I would get out and walk around some, but then I would go back and I would go out and we could get water, you know. We could go around the camp. We, we was free to go move in the camp. And they were still people trying to escape out of the camp. They were two or three that escaped out from under the fence. But um, I didn't try it. I stayed, I was being treated pretty good. I said, well, why? Do it. In your walking around from day to day, were you able to see any of your fellow comrades that you were with you in your unit when you guys were attempting to... Recaptured this? with? Yes, yeah. They, because they recaptured and put us all back in the same prison camp that we liberated. So you, were you able to speak with them at any time? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And were they being treated okay? Uh, some of them weren't. And, uh, well, some of them really... I don't know what you'd say whether they were arguing with them or not. But the one that would try to, wouldn't cooperate. I guess that's the word to use. If you didn't cooperate with them, well, they were, they would come and get you. Because now, they didn't want no troublemakers in there. Right. Were you witness or through scuttlebutt heard any of the POWs that were killed for what you were talking about, not being nonconformist, I guess would be another way of putting it. Yeah, uh, but no, I didn't know, I hadn't heard of anybody in it. So 28 days, how did you guys, how did this rescue happen of, uh, of the, or liberation of the Stalag happen for you guys by the, uh, the seventh armored division? The seventh armored come in. Okay, what happened and what were you guys thinking when that happened? Well, we didn't know really what was happening because we could hear gunfire and artillery stuff and like that, but nothing landed in the camp. And that made us say, wonder, you know, what was going on because you could hear artillery everywhere. And then we saw the American tanks coming in. They came in first. And when you saw stars on the tanks where you knew they were our people. 
And but naturally, when they opened the gate, we were all gathered around them. And it wasn't too, I don't know, maybe an hour or so before the Red Cross come in. They were right behind them. And they gave cigarettes and candy and stuff like that. Now, this was in the winter time, correct? Right, winter time. So, I don't know much more I can tell. How did you guys, uh, as, as far as the actual barracks that you guys were housed in, how were they heated? They have a wood burning stove wood or something? Wood stove, yeah. Okay. Wood stove. Even to the trucks was wood, wood burning. The trucks. They were run by wood, how to describe it. Not a stove on it, but it was wood burning. The stove, the trucks, back in the reaction line back there. And they were heaters, wood stove heaters. So you guys were fairly comfortable giving the weather? Fairly, fairly comfortable, yeah. It wasn't at home, but uh, it was comfortable. And we had our overcoats. Did any of the Germans were captured or did any even stay around to just say, okay, I give up? Or did all of them leave whenever the raid uh, on this had happened? The old men, they gave up. They, some of them that were guarding us, they even come into camp with us. They said, we're not gonna fight, kaput, it's all gone. And they even came into the camp with us. Then naturally we told them, you know, who our men, who they were, and they separated them. So they just laid their arms down, or they gave them they, to you guys, just, and they just laid, and them, said, laid their arms down, and said that was it. Okay. And so, how were you transferred out to the hospital? Uh, <laughs> you know, I think it was by half track that we went back to a, a little ways and then uh, airfield. Then they took it by plane to the hospital, the 23rd General Hospital there in France. And from there. So what was your mindset now? I'm of getting rescued and, and going and rescued, getting care. and I'm freed, and I hope I'm going home. And they said, well, we gotta put you in the hospital first. So they put me in the 23rd General Hospital, and I stayed there, for, I guess, a month. And from there, they flew us to, I think it was La Havre, and there we took the Liberty ship back home. So what is your overall uh, remembrance of the war? How would you sum that up, your experience with being, and, and thinking of things in retrospect as you understand them uh, in terms of how history has unfolded them, with being with a general like Patton, being in a famous outfit that you were in, even doing something that was probably the wrong thing to do, the orders you were given, how do you sum all this up with your experience? <sighs> I don't know, but um, I'll say this. I wouldn't take $10,000 for my experience, but I wouldn't do it again because your, your life was on the line every day. And I've had so many close calls, even when we were in battle. They would drop bombs on us. Well, no two bombs will land in the same hole. So we would race for the one that just exploded. It was hot in there, but we knew a bomb wouldn't land there. And we just leapfrogged through it. And we would uh, get into a few tank battles. And you really didn't think too much, I didn't think too much about it because it was either kill or be killed. And when I was shooting the machine gun, one of my buddies would get 
shot on the tank with me, all I could do was just kick him off to make more room for us. And I'd continue shooting. So really, you had a buddy today, but he was gone tomorrow. I noticed in some of the paperwork that you were sharing with me that you have had correspondence with several over the years. Yes, I have. How do you guys reminisce your thoughts together? Well, we get, had different points of view of it, like the uh, uh, guy there had. And every one of us had a different tale to tale, to tale I guess you'd say. But we were all in the same, like him, he wrote his for an article, newspaper article it looked like, because mine is straight facts. And he, I think, wrote an article on it. He put in a lot of stuff that... That maybe you disagree with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how was your life after the service? How did you go from having this kind of action, being a POW, to coming home? How were you received? How did you assimilate yourself back to life? Well, when I first got back, there was a POW camp here, outside of Gupport. I went and asked them, could I be a guard? Because I wanted revenge. But they wouldn't let me do it. <laughs> so, and I was sitting right here on the front porch when um, Roosevelt died. He died right afterwards. And I was sitting here on the front porch. And I went right back to work. Good friend of mine there, and he was like a second father to me. He run the grocery store, and I helped him in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. So basically, you essentially did what you had to do. You came back home and went on with your life. Right. It wasn't too long, maybe a year afterward, I got a job at the VA hospital, nursing assistant. And I retired from that. So for 30, 35 years, I worked at the VA hospital. Now I've been retired. Well, I retired in 80. What's that, about 25 years I've been retired? A long time. It is. And you're looking great. Well, I feel good. I feel good. I just wish the wife would feel good, but the daughter's keeping her. I'm here by myself. And she came to be with me on this. But she's keeping the wife. And well, sir, I want to say thank you for your service to our country. Well, uh, It's something that my generation and all Americans should be honored and privileged and go up and shake every World War II veteran's hand because of the life that we live today thanks to your dedication and your sacrifice. Yeah. Well, I may have missed something out. Like I say, there's more in my, I don't think I missed too much. But uh, that's the reason I had that to write down. I wrote it down. I was all by myself thinking, you know. That, but uh, I pretty well covered everything. Well, that ends the interview with uh, Edgar L. McKay on August the 19th, 2010.